Located 60 miles east of Portland, Oregon, Hood River County School District incorporates the entire county of Hood River and consists of five elementary schools, two middle schools, one high school, and one K-8 through school. In November 2008, voters overwhelmingly supported a $25 million facilities improvement bond, which provided building upgrades to each facility. One of the oldest of these schools was Hood River Middle School, where the historic main school building consumed large amounts of operational energy. At the same time, a growing student population had forced the music program into an old bus barn, and students conducted science experiments in labs that were old and outdated. An unlikely marriage of the two disciplines led to the new Hood River Middle School Music and Science Building. The Music and Science Building, which opened in 2010, operates on a net zero annual energy budget and is certified LEED Platinum under the LEED for Schools 2007 rating system. This project uh, uh, was initiated as a building bond construction project for Hood River County School District. Uh, it, we had projects at all of the campuses within our school district and one day, I remember it quite well, uh, we were walking with the architecture firm, Opsis Architecture, and um, they were talking to, to me and also Michael Becker, who was with us, as so we were walking around the campus, about uh, wanting to do some sort of demonstration project around environmental construction and design. And um, they found the right place. Uh, we were very interested in doing something like that. Um, and that's really what sparked the entire lead building process here at Hood River Middle School is that is that day and all of our interests converging together to build something really special for the kids. Well, it was interesting when we first started working with the district, they were um, uh, actually questioning a little bit about working with lead. Uh, they kind of, I, I suppose, maybe reluctantly said, uh, why don't you take one of the seven schools that we're working on and, and look at that as a lead project. Uh, but once we got into the project um, uh, and met with the science faculty uh, at the school, saw the opportunities there, became clear that this was an opportunity to really go beyond uh, even the LEAP uh, uh, submittal to something greater. And that's where the Net Zero project came up. Uh, but all the way through the project, we did use the LEAP um, standards uh, as a way to measure what our performance was on all the other issues other than the energy performance. We started with a, uh, an eco charrette right off the bat. Um, we weren't even really sure what the project was going to be initially, and, and we talked to uh, the, the uh, people at the school, and they said, hey, you know, we want to do this science lab, and, and we want it to be as, as sustainable as possible. We want to use the, the building as a teaching tool. So we brought um, our engineers and landscape architect in. Uh, we brought uh, school administrators, uh, school board folks, students, teachers in. And we all sat down and, uh, and did this eco charrette and talked about what our goals were. And that it was more, mostly focused on you know, sustainability goals. And they were very lofty goals about trying to do net zero uh, energy, net zero water. Um, and so, you know, once we kind of got that established, you know, we, we said, hey, you know, this is definitely going to be uh, able to, to get LEED certification, so why don't we just do that as well? And, uh, and they were on board with that. Well, I think that the best example of involving the kids is we had a, what was called an eco charrette, which was a new term for me, um, but we had a collection of professionals. Uh, in the design and engineering field. We had environmental engineers, we had architects, uh, civil engineers, landscape designers. Um, we had school people like myself, a school board member, and then we had kids and the kids contributed quite a bit. Um, so we talked about how the building would be used and what features would uh, the kids uh, uh, get to um, best benefit from for their education. There's one thing that sticks, uh, sticks out to me and that is a skateboard rack. And so we talked a lot about uh, encouraging kids to use non-mechanized transport to get to school, walking, biking, is what we always say, walking and biking, and the kids, uh, one of the kids said, well, what about skateboarding, you know? And we said, yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. And he said, but the problem is, is there's no place to put the skateboard. And so we have a skateboard rack system next to our bike racks. And so that's one concrete example 
uh, that I point to that if a, if a student had not spoke up about that, that skateboard rack would not be on our campus today. From participation in the local farmer's market to exposed building elements, the Hood River Middle School project is designed to fully integrate sustainable design with sustainability education. As part of a hands-on, nature-based curriculum, the students touch, explore, and interact with their surroundings. As a resource for the community, the sustainable education goals extend to the wider community, the music room is available for community events, and the outdoor amphitheater overlooking the greenhouse is accessible to the public in addition to serving as an outdoor classroom for the children. Well, I really started, um, I think, working with uh, the teachers. I think when we look at integrated design, it's more than just a systems approach, but it's a holistic building approach about what is the building trying to do, what's his vision, uh, and in this case it's an educational building for middle school students. So what did it mean to be uh, a building that could help students understand, in this case, uh, science on one hand uh, and then music on another. So two very different uh, uh, programs uh, in the arts and sciences combined together in one building. And so we were um, interested in that and from a holistic viewpoint how could we have the systems of the building really leverage those uh, mission and goal that, that sort of mission and goal for uh, the client and turn it into something greater so the building becomes a building that teaches uh, the students at the same time that it really supports all their needs so from the very beginning we wanted this structure the building itself to be more than just a house just more than just a place to house kids while they're learning we wanted the building to actually teach the kids so we designed all sorts of features so all sorts of interpretive features we had entire meetings and days of planning on interpretive signs uh, we have a data dashboard that's linked to our website uh, kids use the information about the building, how much electricity is being produced and how much electricity is being consumed, water usage, to actually teach them about how what they can do as, as consumers to help protect uh, their natural resources. The Lead for Schools rating system offers a unique innovation in design credit titled School as a Teaching Tool. This credit has remained the same for LEAD for Schools 2007, 2009, and LEAD version 4. The requirements for the credit are design a curriculum based on the high performance features of the building and commit to implementing the curriculum within 10 months of LEAD certification. In addition to the features themselves, the curriculum should explore the relationship between human ecology, natural ecology, and the building. Curriculum must meet local or state curriculum standards, be approved by school administrators, and provide 10 or more hours of classroom instruction per year per full-time student. At Hood River Middle School, a curriculum was already in place based around the ideas of permaculture, using a student garden and a small solar array which students use to create an energy budget for their activities. The team expanded the palette of elements that are used as teaching tools from the starting point. The new building contains a music room, practice rooms, teacher offices, and a science lab. The greenhouse, where students grow plants using a biofiltration system that recycles nutrient-rich wastewater from fish tanks for irrigation, is central to the curriculum. The school's Food and Conservation Science program includes a cultural cooking elective that allows students to develop nutritionally balanced menus based on food from countries they have researched in social studies. They develop shopping budgets, discover links between culture, food, and the geography of a region, and ultimately prepare a meal for an audience in a cafe setting. In addition to the school as a teaching tool credit, the project also achieved another innovation in design credit called Building Systems Education. The intent of this credit is to provide an education to the public, focusing on green building strategies and solutions. The project incorporated three educational elements that help educate the public community in addition to the students. One, a green screen, or building dashboard, is located in the kiosk in the Music and Science Building's main entry. 
The green screen provides real-time updates on the building's energy performance and interactive displays to highlight the project's green features. Two, permanent building signage is located throughout the building and site to explain the building's sustainability features. Three, a case study that highlights the project's green site and building features is distributed at school open houses and by the design team to inform clients about green building on other projects. This innovation in design credit, which can be used by all B, D, and C lead rating systems, can be found in the Interpretations Database on the USGBC's website under the title Green Building Education. We, we did uh, the school as a teaching tool uh, um, innovation in design credit, which is one of the, the uh, lead for schools uh, credits. And um, it, as, as, in addition to that, we did uh, a building education innovation in, in design credit. Uh, so we, we created a lot of signage in the school um, that uh, we, we uh, put up. And I, I think it's been a really big success there. Uh, we have a, a kiosk that has the building dashboard, uh, which takes all of the, the real-time energy uh, production and use information. Uh, and you can see it right there in the in the lobby of the school on the screen. Uh, the school as a teaching tool credit um, was actually more based on uh, the school's curriculum, uh, and they had already set up their curriculum prior to this project even starting uh, in terms of having a uh, you know, talking about natural systems and and human systems and how they. Uh, how they integrate with the a, a built with the built environment, and so I, it was pretty easy for them to to use our building to uh, incorporate into that. I think there were 10 hours per semester that were required uh, to get that credit, and and they they must do uh, 80 hours. Uh. Interestingly, with the project-based learning um, here, emphasis on gardens, uh, one of the issues we've seen in other sort of garden classroom projects is the literal distance between the classroom and the garden. When you have limited amount of time with students, it gets to be a real issue. And particularly project-based learning that wants to go back and forth between working on something that's real out in the field and working with something with, say, technology in the classroom, you want to be able to go back and forth. You want to test it and come back into the classroom and understand the concepts and then go back out and test it again as you modify things. So we had a whole issue about how to make that connectivity, and that's where the plan came of Garden Greenhouse Lab with this clear, simple movement and a visual connection so the teacher could be in the lab and look into the greenhouse and from the greenhouse look into the garden and have a... a saw the frogs for the first time it was pretty exciting they're like well, where'd you get the frogs i was like i didn't get the frogs anywhere they just showed up you know if you build good habitat then that's what's going to happen so they were pretty excited about that so this is going to be a natural building process so last year the kids in math class laid out all the joints and uh we're working on down to the nearest 16th how do we get this thing all laid out and so you can see all the layout marks on the beams and everything and some fairly complex joint work for a 12 year old to be working on and there's no there's these bolts here but in the main superstructure there's no nails or metal hardware it's all pegged together with oak dowels so they had to brace and bid all the holes and get everything all lined up and do all the joint work this is going to be a natural building demonstration area so this wall here is going to be cordwood masonry where we'll have a rubble trench you know concrete scrap concrete uh, foundation going here and then it's a sand and straw clay and then uh, eight inch log ends so this will all be cordwood masonry and then straw bale on the back wall and cob on the far wall so it'll be a natural building place where you can come and see what the different things look like and then this is our tool shed so we'll have all kinds of equipment going in here so it's just this constant state of design and increasing productivity in a 
more compact way. Uh, that where we were just talking there, that idea of in a short bit of time, if we're all working together, we can make the place better. That's really an important theme. The idea that uh, places don't have to get worse because people are there. They, they can get better. They can get more productive and more diverse and, and have more habitat and produce more food and be a nice place to be uh, if we design them right. And so that's what they're constantly doing is being the designers. Are all sculptures. We had a metal artist come and so every one is, all, every sprinkler is different and they all have a name and the kids know who, who, who made those. And so we're just always looking at you know, how do we mix this idea of art and science together in such a way that when people walk into the space, they're just like, wow, this is, this is a nice place to be. We want to be here. And I think part of the reason we, we don't really have any real, like our tools and shovels and wheelbarrows, everything's just out. We don't really worry about anything disappearing. People come by and eat raspberries or take a pumpkin or whatever. It's just, you know. And in a lot of places, I feel like that initial part, that's it. Right? Well, we're going to do a scale drawing today, or we're going to do, we're going to make a plan, or we're going to think about, or whatever. Whereas here, yeah, we're going to do that, and we're going to write about it. And there, I call it the price of admission, like your 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 analysis paragraph, or your scale drawing, or whatever it is that you you have to do to show that you've really thought this through. But then, we're going to do it too. We're we're going to build it and, and test it and see how it works. And and we know that sometimes it doesn't work right, and so we go back to the drawing board and we take things apart and we uh, decide that we learned and maybe we need to do it different next time. And uh, so we, uh, I think that a lot of science in a lot of schools is a very canned where the outcome is already a known quantity before anybody ever starts. And I for one don't find that particularly inspiring and I don't think kids do either. And so when they feel like they're truly part of the creative process and have a stake in what the final product is, it raises expectations and levels of their productivity dramatically. A robust graphics program coupled with a variety of displays contributes directly to the Building Systems Education Innovation Credit, educating both students and visitors. At the same time, the signage and displays support the school in its role as a teaching tool. Located on the exterior of the building near the entry, a resource diagram demonstrates the flows of various resources through the site and building. Solar energy, geothermal energy, food production, rainwater and creek water collection and use, stormwater treatment, transportation. The indoor kiosk in the lobby of the building features an electronic display of the green screen dashboard, as well as a variety of graphical signs that tell the story of the building and all its systems. Feedback from the students was crucial to improve the education tools throughout the structure. When the graphics team presented mock-ups of the signs to a room full of kids, they received candid advice on what appeals to kids. Using actual photographs is good. Lots of text is bad. Keep it simple to make it accessible. The dashboard is used in classroom activities by the students as they research electrical and water use in buildings. Because it is accessible by internet, the dashboard is also available to the wider school district and to the community as an educational resource. Other individual displays are found throughout the building, describing sustainable features and components of the school. These signs were intentionally designed as paper inserts that can be changed over time. The school was provided with a template for the inserts, so teachers and students can update them according to their research on the building. In another display technique, the design team made the guts of the building, the systems and construction, visible to students and visitors. Using cutaways in strategic locations, they reveal elements such as the layers of the building's highly efficient envelope. A hole in the floor slab exposes the tubing of the radiant floor system. Another part of that uh, is we really saw it being successfully used uh, uh, this year when they built a, uh, uh, a really a whole ecosystem in the greenhouse. Uh, 
um, a system that takes uh, water tanks filled with tapia fish. Uh, uh, above that, a series of planks that hold uh, uh, plants to filter water, where the students are understanding the whole ecosystem of how resources are used and how energy uh, and waste is treated through a, through a closed system. When we saw that being designed by the students, and it was fully designed, uh, the teacher came and said, I want you to design the system. You have to figure out how to do it. It was great to watch the students both building the thing, in the building the actual project in the, in the uh, uh, greenhouse, but also moving back into the classroom, uh, working on the smart board as a group, getting online to understand what size pumps they needed, uh, what were all the resources that they were going to need, and pull that whole thing together in a project-based learning uh, format. That's the real key to the education part, is it's sort of learning by doing, uh, not just as an ab abstract thing, but actually doing it. All these tanks are tied together with this pipe at the bottom. And so the, the water gravity flows over here to our pump. It's a super efficient 113 horsepower pump. We figured it cost us about $18 a year in electricity to run it, so no big deal. Pumps up here to a diffuser bar that sprays the water out into the gravel mix. And then that bed, you can see the pond liner, so it's a, just a, a waterproof layer, and it's at an angle, so it, the water just by gravity flows all the way down and comes out the, uh, there's a valve right in, in there. And then flows back through this one, through this drain, and then gravity feed aerates the tanks so essentially we've built a 32 foot creek bed and as the water travels through it is uh, all the nitrogen waste from the fish is being used by the plant roots and the nitrogen rich rooted plant environment up there creates lots of bacteria and algae which drops back in and loads the tank with algae and the fish are algae eaters so we don't even have to feed the fish they're able to eat what just drips down out of the system and grows in the tanks. And then we're able to do things like this. So this was a cutting about a week ago from the grapes outside. So we spent, I don't know, $16 a piece on four really nice grapes to have there. We took 20 cuttings off of each one just the other day. They'll all root. We put them in a pot. They sell for 10 bucks a piece at the farmer's market next spring. So. The amount of increase in productivity in the system is really only limited by how creative can we get. And so kids are just constantly being the ones that are like, well, let's try this and see what happens. So we'll have, uh, right now there's just some goldfish in these tanks, but we, we're working on our permit right now through Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to have tilapia in here. They have to come and do an inspection and see our system. And then, uh, we'll be able to raise tilapia and have a harvest every six to nine months where we're selling fish out of the tanks. And we have two restaurants in town that do fish tacos that have said they'll buy everything that we can produce. So we're able to, uh, we have a market already dialed out. So we'll have income coming into the system to be able to fund future projects. Lead for Schools is part of the Building Design and Construction family of rating systems. First released in 2007, the Lead for Schools rating system recognizes the unique nature of the design and construction of K-12 schools. Based on Lead for New Construction, it addresses the uniqueness of school spaces and children's health issues such as classroom acoustics, master planning, mold prevention, and environmental site assessment. Um, I think the lead for schools, uh, it, it definitely has some particular emphasis uh, uh, in terms of some aspects, in terms of acoustics and others that uh, make it a little bit different, but essentially it's all of the same areas that we look at in any project. Uh, uh, in a way, when we talk about the integrated design process, for us it's not just strictly looking at the points and trying to figure out how to meet points, it's trying to figure out how to get all the systems to leverage each other and we found when you do that and look for those synergies, you'll naturally start to gain the points that you need. Uh, we've never really had a problem achieving the points uh, through the process. It's, it's really 
understanding how to do it effectively and efficiently, uh, one of the things the district was, was really concerned about from the very beginning when we mentioned LEED was additional costs. What would this mean? Is this going to add more costs to the project? And so we had to go through a very uh, 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 stringent process of looking at each part of what we were doing that was a system that might have been, uh, I guess, above and beyond the typical building system uh, and make sure that it, it was really gaining benefits, whether they were educational benefits or whether they were energy benefits, long-term durability benefits, all of those things came into under, making them understand or letting them make a decision about whether that was the right way to go. Hood River County, Oregon is located in the Columbia River Gorge in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Positioned at the crossroads of the spectacular Columbia River Gorge and the magnificent Cascade Range, the county is known for its unusual mix of geology and climate. Cascade Locks on the western edge of the county sits at just 60 feet above sea level, while the county's south border soars to the 11,230-foot summit of Mount Hood, Oregon's tallest peak. The city of Hood River is located at the confluence of the Hood River and Columbia River in the heart of the Columbia River Gorge. Its steep walls, coupled with rapid temperature changes along this corridor, force strong winds to blow year-round through Hood River and give it its legitimate claim as the windsurfing capital of the world. The city is located at the transition zone between wet temperate rainforest to the west and dry shrub steppe desert to the east. Hood River has rainy winters and an average of 25.5 inches of snow each year. Summers are mild, with the average high in August at 82 degrees. The school site is on a nine-acre parcel, a prominent site overlooking the Columbia River and Mount Adams to the north. Kind of interesting with this project, almost every project, if we're building a building, a new building, which this was on a site, we're often looking for that east-west orientation of the building. But uh, in this case, we had a site that literally had been uh, prescribed and it had two major criteria to it. One was that the garden and greenhouse, which were part of the environmental learning program, actually the key part of the environmental learning program where students did project-based learning, had to achieve the maximum amount of sunlight. So here we were faced with a project, an architectural project, which was really being driven essentially by a landscape and uh, a greenhouse as the, as the driver. So those really took the pro prominent site in terms of an east-west orientation where we could achieve sun between shadows of the existing historic building that was on the site and trees to the east. So we were kind of stuck between these two places with the site then for our physical structure of the classroom and the music rooms that was going north-south. That presented a lot of interesting uh, issues with us in terms of the building massing to try and bring natural light, uh, create the maximum amount of, um, of south-facing roof area that would be at the appropriate angle to uh, for the photovoltaics. And so what we ended up were two gables, uh, essentially a, a large sawtooth facing south, that enabled us to both get the, the south area for the photovoltaics as well as natural light through uh, north-facing monitors and skylights. We set up to meet with the architects. Uh, we said this space, this green fence, had to be finished first before the building got done. And, and they said, well, we always, we do buildings first and then the grounds. And we're like, well, I guess we're looking for a different architect then. <laughs> and uh, they, they finally, at that point, I think, got that we were really trying to do something different. It wasn't just a building, but it was uh, you know, a central hub of a space that was going to be far more complex than just a classroom. The original building, now inhabited by Hood River Middle School, was built in 1927 and served as the town's high school. The building is listed on the U.S. National Register of Historic Places. The school's Historic Preservation Committee required the addition to reflect the style of the original building, which has a concrete foundation and structure with a tan brick veneer in a common bond pattern. The original Jacobethian stylistic elements include a steeply pitched gabled roof with gabled parapets and terracotta copings. While not included in the LEED certification or the net zero calculations, the historical building had much of its equipment upgraded during the construction. 
major mechanical systems were installed and the lighting and plumbing systems were replaced. Following that sort of understanding of creating the, the massing of the building, the next part, part was really thinking about the envelope. Uh, we knew in a sense that the building uh, uh, from the client wanted to be a brick building to match the architecture of the existing National Historic Registered Building. Uh, and one interesting thing about that is uh, through the process, uh, not only did we have a few skeptics in terms of uh, lead and, and perhaps some of the net zero issues, but we also had a lot of skeptics worried that a net zero or highly sustainable building would not fit within the historic context of the existing site. And in fact, there was a historic design review board that had to approve the project. Uh, the the main campus at Hood River Middle School is listed on the U.S. Department of Interior's National Historic Landmark list. Uh, it's a community treasure. This building uh, is a place that our community knows well. It's used extensively for uh, musical performances and community gatherings, and this auditorium is really a, a crowning achievement of our old building here. Um, when we were designing the new structure, it was really important uh, for me to make sure that we were uh, honoring the tradition of the, the building itself and its importance to the community. And this auditorium is a good example of, of um, what the, the wonder uh, that this school inspires uh, in new ways, but also in the new ways with our new LEED building. But beyond that, we knew we wanted the brick envelope to even have more um, uh, thermal properties. So we went uh, with an iso block, a foam block with a poured concrete core. That gave us a very high efficient wall system. It gave us, which was very interesting to the client, a very durable long-term building. They've had some other buildings that were built uh, that uh, had some frame structures that were not really uh, long-term. And so they really liked that idea. It also gave us a high thermal mass. And additionally, we had this interesting problem of an acoustical space for music and science, which needed to be separated. So the high mass of the building really helped for bringing those music practice rooms into uh, a very isolated uh, space for acoustics. Um, we were able to use the energy model as a, as a design tool. Um, we uh, also used our daylighting model. We had several different daylighting schemes with skylights in different locations or clear story windows. Um, and we wound up you know, taking those designs and putting them both through the energy model and through the daylighting model. Um, and then had to kind of balance the results. Um, it actually was somewhat counterintuitive in the results. I'm really glad that we did the models because we, what I would have assumed was the best uh, daylighting uh, for the space wasn't necessarily what, uh, what the model showed. So we used a number of different modeling uh, software um, pieces on the project. Uh, the main energy model was done in, in eQuest, um, but we also, uh, the engineers used uh, PV Watt to model the uh, solar. Uh, design um, and they used a, a software um, to model the, uh, the geo exchange um, system. I think those work largely pretty well. You know, I think eQuest was a little bit of a blunt tool for uh, this project. You know, the the geo exchange system uh, and the, I think the radiant slab. There's not really a you know a drop-down menu that you can just pick those, and uh, and so they had to um, I think kind of fudge a little bit to to try to get the model uh, to accurately reflect what we were trying to do. Um, uh, working with interface engineering, uh, we went through a lot of alternatives, to looking at di different energy systems and how we could make it very efficient. So we ended up with. Uh, uh, we looked uh, in the early um, eco charrette for we had the, on the project. Uh, it was actually interesting because in, in thinking about resources, it was one of the middle school students when our uh, engineer said, what, what resources are out here on the site? Somebody brought up the stream that was nearby, and it turns out we had, uh, the, the district had um, uh, water rights to that. They were actually using it to irrigate the existing football fields. So we thought, well, there's an, a resource of, uh, of water that we could tap into. Uh, we looked at uh, geothermal as well. Uh, again, we saw this giant uh, football field right next to the site, and so in the end, we ended up 
uh, horizontal drilling for uh, geothermal under that field, it didn't disrupt the field at all. Uh, and we're able to bring those resources to the site. So we ended up with this radiant uh, slab system, which worked great for uh, our two big rooms. Uh, we have a, a, a music room, which is a tall, big space. We wanted to kind of keep our, our heating and cooling down at the level of the students. Uh, same thing with the tall space in the, um, in the science room. So that was a great system for that. We also have some uh, uh, forced air system for ventilation and there we wanted to achieve real efficiency so we brought in uh, essentially a plenum space behind um, the photovoltaic panels and that preheats uh, um, the air for uh, uh, the uh, fresh air going into the forced air system so between all those systems we were able to develop and then the photovoltaics on the roof uh, a really, I guess, complex in one way, but very synergistic set of systems that, it, that can achieve that net zero energy use. Students in the Music and Science Building not only learn from the building, they contribute to its performance. Building features such as photovoltaic panels on the roof and thermal walls are key strategies for an energy efficient building. But student participation in energy conservation practices, such as unplugging items not in use, is essential to the building's ability to achieve net zero energy. Really the, the driver through it was the idea about education. What became clear to us early in that charrette and as we started to work with the, um, with the instructors of the school and started to think about it, uh, one of the things that drove us toward the net zero was the idea about the simplicity of that is the building is a teaching tool. And what I mean there is that it's easy to say, okay, and demonstrate, uh, have a meter on the wall and say this building's only using, uh, you know, 70% or 60% of what a normal building would uh, use. Um, uh, but what does that mean to a middle school student? They look at it and say 60% of what, and we're talking about BTUs and kilobtus and BTU hours. They're all learning those things, but they're, they're hard to grasp. They're hard to say, uh, what they're hard for anybody to grasp as to what that energy use actually equates to. And so when we talked about net zero and said, we can do a building that uses no energy uh, averaged over a year, and importantly, it's heavily dependent on how the students and occupants of the building use it. If they leave the doors open uh, in the middle of the winter and all the heat escapes, uh, if they leave all, all their computers and lights turned on, um, if they don't use it properly, then it won't be net zero. So that set up a challenge, and it was what I called a challenge with a real finish line. I talked at one time to the school board, uh, uh, teaching energy uh, consciousness uh, is like a, 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 a track meet. We talked about the, the track and I said, you know, if we said it was a hundred yard dash, but where is that on, on the field, on the, on the track? Well, it's somewhere between, you know, out there and over there. The students wouldn't know where the deadline was, but zero is a really great number because it's very absolute. We'd say, you're not going to use any more than you can actually produce. And that gets them thinking, well, how much can we produce? What's the weather like? How much are we using? What am I doing to not hit zero? I already had a PV panel set up in their garden uh, that this science class had, had uh, gotten a grant to put in, and they used the energy from that. They kept an energy budget uh, of how much uh, energy was generated and tried to use no more than that in their garden. So they already sort of had this concept of a, a net zero um, uh, in the curriculum, and we just took that uh, idea and, and made it into a larger scale. Um, with the design of the PV system, it was a real challenge with the limited amount of, of south-facing uh, roof that we had to uh, try and generate enough electricity to, to, uh, to feed the whole building on, a, on an annual basis. Um, so we, we wound up having to spend a little bit more on solar panels that were more efficient um, so that we could fit them on, onto the roof. As an educational tool, um, we see it even more important because there are so many, so few opportunities to hit so many students um, that, there, that happens in a school. So in a school, if we design a commercial building, the people that use it uh, might understand net zero. But here we're really 
uh, we talk about like commissioning students for the future. Uh, we want students that understand what energy use is so that when they become uh, professionals or whatever they're doing in life or whether they're in their own house or in their own office building or become engineers or become artists or whatever they become, they're understanding what energy use is. So it's getting away from the idea of flicking the switch, that that's how we understand energy today. We kind of have a vague idea if we flick it, we're using it, but we don't have any idea how much. If we go back uh, probably a hundred years, thousand years, whatever, we knew much more. If we go back to the area time of energy in a cave, you knew exactly how much wood you had to haul into, run a fire to keep warm. We don't know that anymore. So what we're trying to do is figure out how we can reinstill that within our culture, understand what energy actually is. When we came back and looked at the solar produ production, um, the way some the systems are set up, if one of the panels is is uh, shaded, then the entire thing kind of shuts down. Uh, so it's a um, just even a little bit of, of shading can be a big problem. Uh, and so uh, we had to have the contractor come back out and adjust the locations of uh, of some of the panels to uh, to make sure we got. Uh, all of the energy that they were able to, to get from those. First, the first 12 months, they were uh, about 0.5% over the net zero goal. I think part of that was just kind of getting the kinks worked out of the mechanical systems. Um, and uh, from months 6 through 18, uh, they were actually able to, to meet the, uh, the net zero goal uh, and, and exceed it. Um, and they'll be tracking that uh, as uh, you know, through through their curriculum, the kids will actually be looking at that. So, uh, we're actually doing a, a post occupancy evaluation now, um, where we're taking the actual energy data and uh, recalibrating it into the Equest model, uh, so that uh, we can sort of see where the model was working and 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 where it wasn't. The original goal of the project, uh, in addition to doing net zero energy, was to, to do a net zero water uh, project. And uh, there were some regulatory barriers that uh, uh, made it so we weren't able to, to quite achieve that. The rainwater that falls on the roof um, is uh, channeled into a, a 14,000 gallon uh, tank. Um, and that water is used uh, both for flushing toilets in the building, um, it's treated in the building, we have an ozone treatment um, before it uh, is used in, in the toilets, uh, and it's also used for irrigation in the greenhouse and in, in the gardens. As we all know, water is, is probably as big, if not bigger issue uh, on our planet than energy. Um, uh, water can be contaminated, it has all sorts of other things to it that, that uh, we need to be concerned about. So water and, and often waste that's associated uh, with water use uh, became very important. So we looked at, um, uh, interestingly here we had a garden, so we had a lot of aspects for water use, uh, greenhouse as well. And uh, so we wanted to see how we could use water, how we could store it anticipate how much water uh, would be needed. Now fortunately, because there had been this uh, garden program going on at the school for, an, uh, for quite a few years, they'd actually been, they had their own uh, water cistern on an equivalent size building, a small library building right next to our site. So they, they actually understood the kind of water use that they'd been using in their garden. Uh, now they wanted to greatly expand their garden, so we had to take that understanding and move it to a different level. Uh, so we ended up installing a very large um, uh, uh, underground tank for water. And then we also had the stream resource. So interestingly, we were able to both collect water from the roof uh, of the building, but we were also able to collect water offset from the stream. And so within the tank, we actually have the tank divided with an interesting series of uh, valves and overflows that allow uh, the stream, stream to uh, basically infill uh, the uh, resource of water uh, as the water level gets reduced uh, from the rainfall amount uh, during the summer months.
The emphasis on conservation of resources extends beyond net zero goals and permaculture values in the curriculum. Recognizing that the embodied energy that goes into the materials and construction of the building is potentially larger than ongoing operational costs, the design team wanted to do it right the first time. The school owners had learned a hard lesson from skimping on materials for an earlier edition that had failed within 15 years. By selecting long-lasting and durable materials like concrete frame and brick exterior, they hoped to have minimized the need for future renovations. The team also selected locally sourced products when possible, such as the wood windows with triple pane glazing. So yeah, I think is material use, our, our overall philosophy, the, the first goal was to, to reduce material use as much as possible. Um, and so we tried to do things uh, like the radiant slab, it's the structural system, it's a mechanical system, and it's also the finish. We have uh, exposed wood decking um, and no, no drop ceilings in, in the classroom, uh, so that saves on material there. One of the great parts of this was the whole roof structure, uh, the recycled timber for the roof. And uh, when we came to the site, the building actually occupied most of where the existing building is. It was an old bus barn that had been built in the 40s. Um, uh, we call it bus barn, but it must have really been a pretty small bus because it was about uh, 25, I think, 50 feet long. Uh, so, and it had been used for a number of years, really, for a maintenance shed in one half, and then the old music room in what was equivalent of another maintenance room on the other half. And so that building, when we got into it, uh, and crawled in underneath the floor, we realized that it had been built for uh, vehicles to be in it. So it was a very uh, stout uh, timber frame with large uh, timbers uh, under a thick uh, joist, uh, heavily uh, closely spaced under the floor. So we got the idea of, well, let's reuse everything we can from the building that sits on the site uh, in terms of the new building. So uh, early in the process, actually before the design was complete, we let out a contract to uh, uh, to uh, dismantle the building piece by piece with the goal of actually recycling 100% uh, of the building. And uh, interestingly, uh, the, uh, the winning bidder for the project uh, was, the, uh, was the excavation contractor, uh, 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 local excavation contractor who had ne done, never done anything, he torn down a lot of buildings uh, with his big backhoe and crunched them up and sent them to the landfill. But he was very interested in this opportunity, so he had the winning bid. And uh, um, as he actually got into the project, he, he really got into it. And uh, we had bins for every kind of, every nail, every you name it, every single piece that came out of that building, including some historical pieces that he uncovered through the process. Um, and did a great job of really dismantling the building. And he was very interested because he had actually found a new line of work uh, in terms of doing building recycling rather than just building demolition. We worked with our engineer to have those, uh, that lumber graded uh, so we could use it structurally and create these beautiful trusses uh, that span the room. So there's an interesting piece where history, which is a big part of what we want to build in any building, a connection, particularly a school building to community and history. Uh, lumber from the, that was harvested right in that area uh, that then had gone into a building and then come back out, reused and brought back to the building for another hundred years. And what's great is when that lumber was refinished, it looked, it was probably looked better than any lumber you could buy today. I remember we also built um, uh, stud walls, uh, some interior stud walls out of original studs, and we built a small storage building that's adjacent to this that also holds um, additional photovoltaic panels on the roof. We built that out of recycled lumber from the building, and I remember going by one of the carpenters one day when he was working on the project, and I was curious. I went up to him and said, so how do you like working with this lumber that was all recycled? And he said, well, great. It's actually beautiful wood, cuts like butter, and he just sawed through a piece for me. And he said, just look inside, it's like it just came down. And he said, what's also great is the guy who demoed the building took every single nail and everything out of it. So we don't have to worry about anything as we're, as we're rebuilding with that material. The, uh mechanical system uses displacement uh, air ventilation, uh, so it's a, a system that um, 
uses a high volume of air, very large ducts, uh, and then feeds that air into the room, down low in the room, and then the return air is up high. So it kind of, the air kind of trickles into the space and pushes the, the old air out. Uh, so where in a typical system you would get uh, the new air just comes in and kind of mixes with the, the old air, and so if you have a stale smell or, or bad air in there, uh, it doesn't move out of the space uh, as, as quickly. Uh, so it, it improves the air, air quality. And at the same time, it's also a very uh, energy efficient system because it's the, the air is moving slowly, so you don't really need a lot of fan energy to push the air into the space. It's just kind of you know, trickling into the space. Actually, the other piece of the indoor air quality was uh, was using uh, CO2 sensors in the space, so that uh, you don't have to constantly be be uh, providing air. You can can really gauge when the air is uh, needed and when it's not, uh, and and not uh, spend more energy ventilating than you really need to. We live in in Hood River, and most of us choose to live in the Columbia River Gorge because we're surrounded by by natural beauty. But of course, we spend the majority of our lives indoors, and so taking that inspiration and creating environments and spaces like this, where daylighting and acoustics and you know ambient uh, temperature, where everything is designed to inspire uh, creativity and uh, thoughtful reflection with the kids has been an amazing, amazing experience for everyone involved. Um, the more that we can create environments where kids can feel free to express themselves and be creative and think about some of the big issues in this world, we're all gonna be better for that. One of the biggest challenges uh, as far as the lead credits was the, the acoustic credit. Um, wanted to put uh, windows from the science classroom into the mechanical room uh, so that the students could, could see into the mechanical room and really understand uh, you know, how the building systems work. Uh, and the lead credit uh, says that you have to have a certain STC rating in between a classroom and a mechanical room. Um, in our case, uh, our mechanical room had uh, pumps in it. There weren't any air handling units or anything that makes a, a lot of noise. Uh, and so it wasn't as much of an acoustical concern, but uh, we still had to show, in order to get the lead credit, we actually had to get our acoustical engineer out to, to test the space and demonstrate that uh, the noise level wasn't uh, exceeding what, what the standards were to, to meet the credit. I guess uh, one one piece of advice for, for project teams working on lead projects would be to, to uh, you know identify your goals really early uh, and uh, you know go through that lead spreadsheet and, and identify which credits you're, you're pursuing and um, and and do that early on because once you get down down the design process a little bit it makes it a lot harder to go back and, and add something back in. I think leads are a really good tool. Uh, as far as you know, setting and, and achieving goals, um, you know, if, if you're able to, to set your goals and uh, maintain them without doing lead, I think that's fine as well. I think it's re really nice to have that checklist uh, to go through to say, hey, these are some of the things that, that we can do, and then make sure that everybody really follows through on them. I think that's the real value of lead versus you know trying to be lead equivalent. There's an art and a beauty in architecture, and there's an inspiration. So when we think about what does a student think about when they go to uh, create music or when they go to do a science experiment, we think both of those should be an inspiring thing. The, the discovery of learning is really one of the most inspiring things that we as humans do. And so what architecture can support that? And so when we designed this building, we thought about those two main spaces. and what would they be like? And so the, 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 the wood ceilings, the trusses, they're spaces that really make people, when they walk in, they feel good. And it's not just the students, the teachers feel good. And if the teachers feel good, they feel good about teaching. And we hear that in our work often when we go back and pre and post occupancy was, well, what's it like to teach here? And teachers often say, every day I come in, it's just wonderful. I feel great. I, I did think one thing that was really interesting about this project and that I, um, started to think about, and this this project really brought it to the forefront. Was was more of the, I guess 
I don't know if you want to say the, the sublimation of ego or, or whatever is, is just saying that, that you know this is not about you know my idea of creating some sort of form. Uh, this is a, about um, about taking our clients' desires and needs uh, and translating those in, into form. This building itself will be a school in 12 years. It'll be a school in 50 years. Our main campus was opened in 1927, and we're still using the same building. This beautiful structure that we have here, with all of its amazing efficiencies and uh, energy upgrades, will be used as a school, and it will be paying our taxpayers off for many, many years to come. Things I've been thinking a lot about lately, that, you know, how do you, how do you know if you're doing things right and uh, the guy that started permaculture Bill Mollison he, he talks about you know you're doing it right if resources are gathering around you you know and so uh, resources being excitement and learning and excited parents and and funds showing up and productivity in the garden I mean I, I think that something must be happening right because there's a lot going on here